Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. Are you there, Sonia? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, okay. Yeah, I, okay, was perfect. That we, I was worried we lost your sound for a second. No, 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 no. I'm terrible. here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few people in watching. We're just going to take a minute to wait for people to trickle in. Sounds good. Oh, man. Have you been to any other sessions in Lightbox yet? Yes, I have. I've been trying to uh, sneak in and out. And there's also, thankfully, some that you can rewatch. So I've been doing that as well. So that's been good. Yeah. So um, our, all of these live streams that we've been doing, if you ever want to revisit them, they'll all be on our YouTube channel saved in our Lightbox playlist. Yeah, actually, I saw one of them. I saw the one with uh, James Peck. Um, oh, yeah. His was, yeah. he's such a phenomenal teacher. I mean, it makes sense because he's with Brainstorm, but... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I actually, I took one of his classes back when I was still oh, a cool. student. So, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, it was nice seeing him again. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that, that's cool to see. Yeah, and they're, they practice, they're collabing with the giveaways that we're doing too. So it's kind of cool to team up with artists. It's been amazing. Amazing. Awesome. awesome. Well, let's get started. Welcome, everybody. This is Sonia Kristoff. She's going to be going over how to make a stylized environment in Blender. Um, She's a phenomenal artist, and we're so excited to have her with Sense Labs. Um, and we'll we'll just let you do your thing. Thank you, thank you, Shannon. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And yeah, big thank you to you, Shannon, and Sense Labs for sponsoring this talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you guys are looking to buy a new pen tablet, definitely check them out. They make some amazing products. All right, are you guys ready to talk Blender? I hope you are, because that's what we're going to do today. Uh, but before we do that, I want to quickly introduce myself. So hi, my name is Sonia Christoph, and uh, I'm a lead environment artist and a math painter, and I'm also a new schoolism instructor, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, I've worked in the industry for nearly 10 years now, and I've been at studios like Rhythm and Hues, Industrial Light and Magic, uh, The Mill, Ubisoft, and IO Interactive. Uh, I've worked on TV shows like Agent Carter and Burn Notice. I've worked on commercials for Adidas and Chevy. Uh, I've worked on the uh, Iron Man ride in Disneyland Hong Kong, if you've been there. And uh, I've also worked on Soarin' Around the World in Disneyland. Uh, I've worked on movies, uh, Doctor Strange and Tomorrowland are some of the bigger ones. Um, yeah, and then the last few years, I've actually switched over to VR and AAA games. So uh, the games I've worked on are The Division 2 and Hitman 3. So that's just a little bit about me and my professional work, but uh, today we're actually gonna talk about some of my personal work uh, and in particular personal work I like to do in Blender. Now let's talk about Blender and uh, you know, what's <laughs> why all the hype? Because uh, everybody's talking about Blender these days. Um, well, there are a lot of reasons why Blender is a great uh, software. Uh, I'm just gonna mention three of my, uh, of my personal top reasons why it's amazing. And, uh, but first let's talk about what it is. And it's a uh, full 3D creation suite. So traditionally, if you worked in VFX, you had one software for modeling, you had another one for sculpting, uh, another one for texture painting, potentially a fourth one for lighting and rendering, and then you had your compositing software. Now that's four to five softwares you have to learn, know, and potentially pay for if you're a freelance artist. That's a lot. Blender does all those things and then some on top of that, uh, you know, you can also do 2D animation with it. It has a real-time renderer and a path tracer, which is just incredibly powerful. Not only that, it's also incredibly user-friendly, more so than any other 3D software out there right now, in my opinion. Uh, it has a very large and active community, so if you get stuck, it's very easy to reach out and ask for help. And it's also a great community to get inspired by to see what other people are doing. So it's just a, it's an, it's just an, it's an awesome place to be at. And best of all, it's completely free. It's open source. It's free. You can do your personal and commercial projects in it, and it's available on every single platform. So you can get it on Windows, Linux, and Macs. Doesn't really get better than that. All right, I'm here to talk to you guys about this little project that I made. Let me just play that. And uh, this is a little snowy scene that I created in a blender. Uh, and I'm going to share some tips and tricks with you on how I created some of the elements for this scene. 
Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover the Blender basics here, so hopefully you're familiar with them. And if you're not, then hopefully this talk can uh, give you a little glimpse into the possibilities and maybe even inspire you to want to learn Blender in the future. Who knows? We'll see. Let's talk about our topics for today. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, my inspiration for this project. Uh, you know, every time I start a new project, I want to first make sure I know the setting, the story, the style, and the mood. Once I figured those things out, then I could start thinking about what kind of assets do I need to build, and then I can start modeling, which is going to be our next topic. Uh, for the modeling section of this talk, I'm going to show you how I created the trees and the bushes. And I'm going to talk about materials, and I'm going to show you how I created a procedural snow material. Last but not least, I'm going to walk you through my particle setup. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please just post them in the chat as we go, and I'll try to answer them. All right, sound good? Cool. Let's start with inspiration first. All right, setting. Uh, I knew I wanted to create a snowy landscape scene first because I wanted to make it snow, and I wanted to play with dynamic paint. Uh, I'll show you what that is later. Um, so that much I knew. Uh, I knew I wanted to focus on my environment more so than uh, a character, but I still wanted to have a hint of a story. So I was trying to think of, you know, some of my favorite animated winter uh, movies, and one of them was 101 Dalmatians by Disney. And in particular, that one scene came to mind. Uh, if you remember the movie, it's when they're trying to escape and uh, they're trying to cover up their paw prints in the snow. So they're walking on the pond and it's frozen and then they're trying to hide underneath a bridge. That's sort of what inspired uh, my storytelling and my environment. Now it's very subtle, uh, you know, but uh, I have some paw prints in the snow leading up to the frozen pond and then there's the little bridge in the background. Again, it's subtle, but if you're familiar with it, you, uh, you may have picked up on that. Then for the style, uh, I was very much inspired by the Netflix animated movie Klaus. Uh, I love the simplified geometric shapes. It's just a beautiful movie. And I wanted to bring some of those elements into uh, my environment as well. The last but not least, the mood. And for the mood, I wanted this to feel like, you know, the early morning when uh, it just, there's fresh snow on the ground and there's more snow falling down and it's quiet and it's cold but it's just kind of peaceful and uh, just magical. And you just want to stand there with a cup of hot cocoa. Yeah, that's the feeling I was trying to go for. All right, with uh, those things answered, uh, I can then think about what kind of assets do I need to create? And to be honest, I didn't need to create a lot of assets for this scene. Uh, I needed a couple of rocks. I needed some bushes, a tree or two. And then I needed the ground, the bridge, and a little road piece that connects the bridge to the ground. Very straightforward. Modeling didn't take long for these, and uh, that's because I used some very helpful modifiers. Now, let's talk about mo what modifiers are, if you're not familiar with them. So uh, modifiers are automatic operations that affect how an object is rendered without altering the base mesh. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. So here on the left, I have a cube. And I'm just going to do some basic polygon modeling operations on it. I'm just going to select the bottom face, scale it down, and then I'm going to bevel the edges. Very simple stuff. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side, but I'm going to do that with modifiers. So I'm going to take a simple deform modifier, set it to taper, and I'm going to follow that up with a bevel modifier. Same operations, same thing, but the difference being that modifiers are non-destructive. Meaning at any point in time, I can go back to my modifier stack and I can disable them, delete them, and I go back to my original mesh. Now, on the, other, on the left cube that I did my basic polygon modeling on, I can only go back as far as Control Z will take me. So that's a big difference between modifiers and basic uh, polygon modeling. And that's why modifiers are so powerful. Uh, another advantage of modifiers is that they're incredibly fast. You know, you can apply many effects automatically to the entire object. And then again, they're incredibly flexible. So you can move them around. Uh, you can turn one off, then follow it up by another. Um, if you're into concept art, especially modifiers are incredibly useful for you because uh, you never know when your art director is going to come around the corner and be like, all right, let's change this, this, and this, and this. Let's go back to what you had yesterday. 
And <laughs> modifiers can really save you from, you know, having to scrap everything and start from scratch. So they're awesome. And let's see how I use them to uh, create the tree. All right, so here I have a basic cube and I'm just going to select the vertices, merge them down into a single vertex, and then I'm adding a skin modifier. I'm going to enable smooth shading for it. And then I'm going to follow that up with a subdivision surface modifier. And this is just to give more resolution and make it look nicer. All right, now I can select the vertex and I can hit E to extrude it. And you can see the skin modifier automatically created a surface around the edge. I think you can see where I'm starting to go with this because now I can just keep on extruding the vertices and I can start creating my tree. Uh, I can select the vertices and I can decrease or increase the size of the surface with control A. I can uh, add more vertices to the edges by selecting the vertices, right clicking and uh, selecting subdivide. And now I can just move the vertices again, keep extruding them and just shape my tree. Pretty awesome, right? You can also use this if, uh, for example, you have, um, uh, if you're planning on creating a base mesh for a character. So you can use the skin modifier for that, and then you can take it into your sculpting mode. Yeah, any questions so far on this? It doesn't, we don't have any questions coming in. More people saying they thought it looked like Klaus and saying hi, um, and that they really would like to try Blender. So. I, oh, that's I, awesome. I guess <laughs> my question would be, um, what do you recommend for people wanting to try Blender, but are maybe not confident with using new tools? Uh, I think you honestly, you just have to jump in <laughs> and just try it. Like, don't be afraid, uh, you know, don't be afraid of failure. That's probably the big thing I would say. Um, yeah, just give it a try. Uh, I also happen to be, you know, but I'll talk more about that later. But uh, there might be a, there might be a Blender class coming up, so um, oh, yeah, we'll we, talk about that later. Find, where can we find the Blender class? I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll talk about that at the end. Okay. Of this, of this talk. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> eager, a little eager beaver over here. Um, we um, do have a Chelsea that came uh, a question that came in from Chelsea Helms. Do the steps you take to start each piece vary on the type of piece or project it is? Uh, let me pause this video actually, just so I can answer that question. Um, uh, it depends on how complex the project is. Generally, my process is the same. Uh, it just if it's a if it's a very large pro project uh, with multiple assets, then I do a little bit more planning. Um, if it's a smaller project like this one, for example, I didn't need to do a lot of planning. But if it's like a full scale environment with, you know, architecture, nature, characters and everything, then yes, then I usually uh, go into my Trello board and I start figuring out like, what do I need to create? Like, what materials do I need? And then it, like, it, then it gets quite, I get uh, very producer-ish and, uh, you know, I just really start planning things out. But if it's a small project like this, then no. I can't imagine starting a project that big without the groundwork <laughs> or foundation work that you were talking about. I feel like there would be, you know, so many elements yeah. in them. Um, yeah, you can. Cody, Cody Gramstad has a question of when should you use modifiers over classic modeling? Is it a, is it a big, is it ideal to use modifiers in most cases? Uh, I would say probably there's some ways yes and no. Again, if you need the flexibility, then I would say always use the modifiers. Uh, if you're pretty sure what you're going to do, you don't, you're not going to make any changes to it, then you don't need to. Like, you know, if I'm, for, if I'm modeling a chair, then, you know, I can just model that. I don't need to do use modifiers for that. But if, uh, you know, but if I'm doing something a little bit more elaborate, like I'm designing a car, then modifiers can be really helpful. That's All right, should I, should I continue more about uh, how I can yeah, use push? <laughs> questions, are, questions are coming in, so you can continue and we'll have a next section. <laughs> right, sounds good. Um, so uh, here I'm actually uh, walking you through how, I'm, how I created the bush. And the idea for that was that I was going to create a single sort of fan blade, you know, think of the seed corals. Uh, I was just going to create one of those. And then my idea was, um, and I used the same technique that I did uh, for the tree. So I used the skin modifier again, followed it up with a subdivision surface modifier. And uh, then I took that fan blade and I rotated it down. Uh, and then the idea is, is that I make copies of it, rotate them, and then I follow it up with a lattice deformer to shape the bush. 
And if that sounds like a lot of gibberish to you, let me show you what that actually looks like. Um, so here I'm just taking a couple of those points and I'm just offsetting them just a little bit because again, this bush needs to exist in a 3D space and I want to have a little bit of variety to it. Once I'm done with that, almost done, then I'm going to add an array modifier. And the array modifier, you can use that to basically create copies of your mesh. And I'm going to rotate that down to the ground. And then I'm going to add an empty. Uh, an empty is basically like a dummy handler. It's, uh, it's just a little helper. It doesn't render, but you know it can be useful for a number of things like this, for example. Um, so I'm using the empty to basically rotate the copies that I just created in the array modifier. So here I'm specifying the number of copies and now I'm selecting the empty and I'm rotating it and you can see the copies are rotating with it. Uh, now 10 copies is a bit too much. So I'm going to go back, change that to five and let's rotate it again. And you can start to see we're starting to get something. Five is maybe too few. So let's change that to seven, rotate that a little bit more. So I have a nice half sphere. And if I rotate this, you can start to see I'm getting something quite interesting here. Now I'm going to follow that up with a lattice deformer. Now, uh, a lattice is essentially a cage uh, that you can use to deform your mesh. So I can, uh, you can see that orange uh, cage frame there. Uh, I can add more resolution to it. And now I just need to connect the lattice in my lattice modifier. So now it's connected to the bush. And now I can go into the lattice itself uh, and go into edit mode and I can select the points and I can start moving it and you can see the bush is moving with it. Now, the closer the lattice is to your mesh, the more influence it has. And uh, I like using lattices because they give you really nice and smooth deformations. Um, so it's really useful. It doesn't really mess up your UVs or anything like that. So it's, uh, it's a really powerful way to uh, change the look of your mesh. And that was basically the idea I had for creating my bushes. We have a lot of questions rolling in about modifiers. Okay, <laughs> all right, go for it. <laughs> um, so we have one that is, oh my gosh, there's a lot. How do you handle the technology of your models when you're using modifiers? Uh, can you repeat the question? How do uh, I handle the technology? Amir is asking how you handle technology of your models when you're using modifiers. I guess for me, oh, I technology. This, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, I mean, it depends on what, what you're using, which modifiers you're using. So um, subdivision surface modifiers will actually increase your uh, topology and your resolution on your mesh. So that's the whole point of using it. Uh, it's, it's quite useful for that. Um, I mean, if you, if you want to make changes after the fact, so the thing is when you go into, you can turn off the modifiers again at any point in time. Um, but if you need to bake them down, for example, you can just apply them, basically collapse them and permanently, if, uh, yeah, just apply those modifiers to your mesh. Uh, and then you can just do regular polygon modeling. So um, you have the option to do both of those things if you need to do some major cleanup for any reason. Um, I hope that answers that question. I think it does. Amir corrected me in the chat section. I okay, cool. said technology instead of topology. Yeah, like um, technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Chelsea Helms has another uh, question of what add-ons do you recommend in Blender? Oh God, there's so many of them. Uh, there are so many of them. Uh, there are some really great ones for UVing that I like to use. Uh, UV squares. I like to use that one. Um, there are some fun randomized ones, but to be honest, I don't actually use that many. Um, the ones I use the most are for UVing and for textile density. Uh, and that's because, you know, for, for work, I need to, I need, I need those things. Those are very important. Um, but yeah, most of the stuff I actually just, yeah, I just use a uh, blender out of the box pretty much. Oh, that, that sounds great. It seems like yeah. blender we have a lot of questions of like, how do I get into Blender? I'm new to Blender, what do you recommend? But it seems like from what you've said, you just got to step in and kind of go for it. Yes. Yeah, cool. you, you really do. And like I said, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Good. Um, <laughs> and then last question before you move on, um, are you using a tablet or just a mouse when you model? 
Uh, so I'm weird uh, because I also have to work in other modeling softwares and to keep my hotkeys straight, uh, I tend to use a tablet uh, for Blender and I use the mouse for my other modeling software and that kind of helps my brain to keep the hotkeys separate. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that works for me. So Blender is definitely the tablet. Awesome. We'll let you continue. I don't right. want to miss anything. Thank you. All right, so that was basically the little modeling part that I wanted to show you guys. Uh, let's talk about materials next. And I always love playing with materials. Uh, so uh, the materials for the scene, uh, or the materials I needed for the scene was obviously snow. Uh, then I needed a tree bark. And I also needed a combination of the two with snow on top of my uh, tree bark. Now I had some requirements for this. Uh, I was feeling lazy that day. So uh, I didn't want to do any UVs and I did not want to do any texture painting. So I basically just wanted to create my materials, uh, apply them to my scene and just have them magically add snow to the base of my tree trunks and on top of my tree branches without me having to do anything manually. That was the goal. Again, I wasn't really feeling like doing a lot of work that day. Um, yeah, so that's that was what I wanted to do. Um, uh, so when I looked at these reference images, what uh, I liked about the snow in my reference image uh, is the, the nice glistening, the sparkles that you see in the snow. And I mean, those are basically ice crystals, you know, reflecting the light. Now, to be able to achieve that effect, as well as the surface detail of the bark, I needed to use textures. And when it comes to textures, we have two types of textures we can use. We can use image-based textures and we can use procedural textures. Uh, image-based textures are your basic JPEG images. Uh, procedural textures are mathematically generated. That means uh, that uh, they're not limited by resolution, which image-based textures are, and they're also tileable out of the box, which is awesome. The other advantage is that Blender comes with several procedural textures already, so we don't even have to go out and look for them. So this is, again, super useful. And it's actually one of the reasons why I like to use procedural textures whenever I can. All right, let's take a look at what that looks like. So here is uh, my basic look dev scene. And I just have a snowy ground plane and a sphere stuck in it. Uh, let's switch over to the shading workspace. And I'm just going to select my sphere. And then I'm going to find my basic material. There it is. And this is the principled BSDF shader, which is one of the default shaders in Blender. Uh, so first I'm going to create the ice crystals for my scene. And for that, I'm going to use a noise texture, which is a procedural texture. So yeah, I'm going to add that. And then I'm going to follow that up with a texture coordinate and a mapping node. I'm going to change the texture coordinates to object. And this will ensure that uh, the resolution or the scale of my texture is uh, the same across all objects in my scene. And that's super important because I don't want, you know, small ice crystals on one object next to giant ice crystals on another object. So this kind of unifies the whole thing. And uh, yeah, now I can just, uh, I have several settings in the texture itself. I can adjust the scale, I can adjust uh, details. Uh, the distortion gives it some really nice sort of swirly effect, which I kind of like. So yeah, this is giving me uh, something interesting here. And uh, I'm going to follow this up with a color ramp. And you're going to see me use color ramps a lot. They're incredibly useful. And what I'm doing here is I'm just going to use this color ramp to increase my contrast. And I'm basically going to create a black and white mask for uh, my ice crystals. You can see I'm starting to get something that looks quite interesting. All right, that's going to be my mask. Now I'm going to go back to my uh, shader and just set up a basic snow material. Now this is a stylized uh, snow material, so I don't need to do a whole lot to it. I'm just going to add a little bit of a blue color from my base color. And then I'm going to turn off the specularity. I'm going to leave the roughness where it is. And I'm also going to disable the sheen and the clear coat. So it's just a relatively matte material and nothing really to it. But now I'm going to take my black and white mask and I'm going to connect that to the metallic input. And you can start to see we're getting something, something that sort of, uh, we're getting that ice crystal look that I was going for. Now I can go back into my noise texture and I can, you know, adjust the scale. 
Uh, I could also adjust my color ramp if I want to. But yeah, uh, if I adjust the roughness channel, I can uh, sharpen or um, loosen the fall off of the uh, ice crystals, which is really nice. So I have a lot of control, basically. And yeah, that was my basic uh, snow material setup. Quite simple, actually. Yeah, I loved um, seeing how you made it stylized, though. I think that was a great, great point that you just go in and add the bits you want. Um, we do have a question from Andre Lacasse. Uh, do you need a lot of knowledge on 2D media to work in 3D? I would say no, but you do need to understand materials. So you, you, didn't, you do need to have an understanding of how lighting works. And, uh, you know, like you need to be able to, I would say you need to be a good observer. You need to understand what, like what makes metal look like metal. How does it react to light? Uh, you do need to understand those properties because you need to, I mean, just like you saw me dial some of those things in, you didn't get a good look at it because this is stylized, um, but you, there's a lot of different channels. So you need to know like how much specularity do I need for metal? Do I need to set it to metallic or not? You know, like there's a lot of different properties in materials to make them look realistic. So you do need to understand them. How, so on that note, what is your best recommendation to study those materials to get those essentially bits of data that you need? I mean, honestly, there's actually a, a lot of, uh, funny enough, there's actually a lot of, in painting. Um, in painting, a lot of uh, uh, teachers will talk about that. Uh, you know, they will actually help you break that down and sort of understand how lighting works. So I would actually say, yeah, like, uh, take a couple of 2D painting classes because they can help you break that down really, really well. Stretching our artistic um, expressions over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, it, it does, you know, it does go hand in hand, you know, we're artists. So it's like, you know, 3D is just another tool, basically. Definitely. Um, Chelsea Helms also has another question about texture packs. Um, do, you, do you have texture packs outside of Blender program? Um, do you make them yourself or do you just normally use the ones built in? Yeah, so I uh, I do I do textures myself sometimes. Uh, again, it depends on what I need. Uh, for that, I use uh, Substance Designer. Um, uh, I also use uh, Substance Source. That's a great online resource for uh, textures, and uh, also Quixel Mega Scans. So those are photo scanned textures that you can use as well. Now you have to pay for both of those, but uh, yeah, those those are generally my go to sources for textures. Awesome. We have one more question. I'll let you move on. Um, how do you decide between making new material or reusing or downloading one? Um, do you default to making new ones? No, no, because I don't have time. <laughs> time is a big factor in my life. Uh, you know, especially if you have a full-time job and, you know, you have a family and life outside. Uh, time is, is a big factor in making that decision. Uh, the other, the other thing, also, it, it depends on what project I'm doing. So if I'm doing something photorealistic, then it's a lot easier to find those uh, textures online. I don't need to go out and make them necessarily. Um, if it's something stylized, then I do need to create that from scratch myself. Um, but the good thing is, like, once you start creating a couple of those materials, you can save them to a material library, and then you can just reuse them next time. So for my stylized work, yeah, I actually I do have a like a small material library that I created myself and then just keep using as a base and then I make changes on top of that. And that helps speed up the process. Efficiency. That the question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it did. <laughs> and it really comes down to that. It's like, you know, I wish I had all the time in the world, but I, you know, unfortunately I don't. So yeah. Human. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll let, I'll let you continue so you can get to the next bit. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is the tree bark material. And uh, here we go. All right, so um, for the bark, I'm going to set up a, an NPR material. And NPR stands for non-photorealistic. So think of this as your basic tune shader. Now, I've added a basic cylinder to my scene, and that's just sort of there to represent my tree trunk. So to set up a basic tune material, it's actually quite simple. Um, it's actually just, I'm going to pause, stop. Okay, um, it's actually just uh, th these three notes that you need. So you need a shader. So in this case, I'm using a diffuse BSDF shader. I could have also used the principal BSDF shader, but I just need the diffuse channel information. So this saves me from having to turn off the specularity and roughness and all the other things that I need to turn off. Um, so I'm using that basic, well, that basic diffuse material, which gives me my lighting information. Then I'm going to take that lighting information and I'm going to convert it with the shader to RGB node. 
And then I'm going to connect that to a color ramp. Again, the color ramp, they're super useful. Uh, I'm going to set the color ramp to constant. And now you can see I've essentially have full control over my highlights and my shadows. So the black area represents my shadows and I can now change the color of my shadows. So in this case, I'm just going to set it to like a blue purple color. And then and for the highlights, I'm just going to make that a light brown color and that's to represent my basic bark material. And this is your basic tune shader setup. Now you can add more, you can add more colors to this if you want to. You can adjust the color ramp. You can, you know, I can specify where I want the shadows to start and end. And if I if I select the light and I rotate it, you can see the shadows are moving with it. So it's interactive, it updates, it's yeah, it's it's great. But that's your basic tune shader setup. Pretty straightforward. All right, next I'm going to uh, copy the snow material that I did. And I'm just gonna select all, copy it with control C, and I'm going to go back to my bark material and paste it with control V. I'm just gonna leave it there for later. And next I'm going to work on the, uh, the bark texture itself. And for that, I'm going to use a musgrave texture. That's again, a procedural texture. I'm just going to connect that. And uh, you can see we also have similar options that we had before in the noise texture. I can adjust the scale. I can adjust the detail. And we're getting something uh, rather interesting here. Now the detail is sort of connected to the dimensions. So you can see now I'm starting to get something that has somewhat of a look to bark that could work. And uh, if I update this, uh, notice how, where I connected the texture though, it's now uh, creeping into where it's basically completely uh, lost my shadow uh, information. So I don't want that. I wanna keep my shadow, uh, that blue purple color. So to fix that, I just need to disconnect the Musgrave texture from where I had it before. And I need to plug it into the color slot of the diffuse shader. So I need to have it in the beginning of my shader tree. And now you can see, um, I have that shadow information back. Now I can add uh, again, a texture coordinate and a mapping node. Set that to object again. And now I'm going to go into the scale and I'm going to adjust the Z value, which is the, uh, the Z axis is the up axis. And uh, I'm just going to stretch the texture. And it doesn't work well on the sphere, but you can see it working really nicely on the cylinder. And that's basically representative of my tree trunk. So that'll work just fine. All right, let's, stop. let's take a look at that. And that was my basic setup for the tree bark. Again, I can control the color ramp, so I can control where the shadows start or end. I can adjust the scale of the noise. It's very flexible. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. The last thing I need to do here is uh, I need to create a height mask. And this is, uh, I want to use this so I can basically uh, just have snow automatically added on top of my objects in my scene. And to do that, I'm going to use a geometry node. And I'm going to, let me pause that for a second. This is my friend, the color ramp again. Um, so I'm going to use the normal information of my geometry. Uh, normals, think of normals as the direction the components in your mesh are facing. So what I'm doing is I'm basically taking the direction information of my mesh. I'm separating the X, Y, and Z axis with the separate X, Y, and Z node. Uh, and then I'm taking the information of the Z axis, which is again, the up axis, and I'm connect that to a color ramp. And that will give me this, which is exactly what I want. Uh, you can see it also works if I move the cylinder up, if I rotate it, whatever I do with it, and again, that's based, uh, that's, that works because I'm using the normal information, which is the actual information of the mesh itself. So it's not tied to the world position in any way. Uh, then all I have left to do is, uh, you know, I mean, when snow falls on a tree branch, it doesn't just fall in a straight line. So I just want to break up that edge a little bit and I can do that by adding another noise.
Oh, no questions? Are you there? Uh oh, yeah, can you hear me? You, yeah, you froze for a bit. I was worried we lost you. No, okay, okay, we're good. All right. We're good? Okay, so we, we do have one question that I see coming in. Um, do you create concepts for your 3D scenes before you model them? Rarely. Um, I do a lot of concepting in 3D. Uh, I just use, uh, yeah, I do basic blockouts and then, uh, yeah, I just refine it and keep working with it. But yeah, I usually do all my concepting in 3D. Awesome. And then Chelsea wants to know if you can show the skybox. Uh, sorry, I know I can't right now, but honestly, it's the skybox. It's just an HDRI. Uh, there's nothing, nothing fancy to it. It's just an oh. HDRI. I downloaded it from, what was it? Um, Polyhaven. Uh, they have free HDRIs. So I recommend you check them out. Um, any other questions? No? Nope. That's Good. it for now. Cool. Just glad we didn't lose you. <laughs> yeah, I know. All of a sudden, like, I'm like, ah. I got like a message. My internet is unstable for some reason. Oh no. <laughs> I know. I was like, why? <laughs> You're never unstable. What's going on with you? Um, oh man. But uh, basically if, if you, uh, you know, right now what I'm doing is I'm just adjusting the noise scale and you can see that gives me a very different edge breakup. Yeah. And this is essentially how you can uh, procedurally create a, a height, 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 we got height based mask. There we go. That was a difficult one. <laughs> and then all I need to do at the end is just connect everything with a mixed shader node. So for that, I'm going to use the mask I just created, connect that into the factor. And then I'm going to connect the snow material and the tree bark material. And there you go. And I didn't have to do any UVs or texture painting. It just magically worked. All right. If there are no other questions, then I'm going to move on. Sound good? No, you're you're good to move on. People are just glad that we're not frozen. Okay. No, oh, no pun intended. Sorry about that. <laughs> <Zip -tap funny. laughs> In multiple nice. puns. <laughs> nice. <That's> nice. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, then uh, let's talk particles next. So. Um, Particle systems are a collection of small objects that act together as a group. Now you can use particles to create things like dust, rain, or snow. You can also use them to create smoke, clouds, or fire. And you can use them to uh, create strand-based objects like grass, fur, or hair, for example. Now you can use them for a lot more, but that's like the general use or the things that particles are used for most often. Now I obviously use them to create snow. So let's take a look at how you can set them up. All right, here I have uh, a basic ground with a frozen pond. And I'm just going to add a plane to the scene. And I'm going to scale that up. And then I'm going to move it up. And this is going to be the emitter for my particles. And then I'm going to go into the particle tab. And I'm going to click on the plus sign there. And that's going to add a particle system to my mesh. Now I'm going to split my viewport and I'm going to set the bottom viewport to a timeline. And if I hit play, uh, you can see my plane is already starting to emit particles from it. I'm just going to extend the timeline here to a thousand frames. I'm also doing that in the emission setting of the particles. So um, my uh, particles will be emitted for the whole duration of the shot. And there you go. Now it's probably a little bit hard to see because they're super tiny. So let me adjust that. And uh, first I'm going to uh, increase the number of particles, particles that are being emitted to 2000. So I'm going to double that. And then if I go into the viewport display options, I can increase the size of the particles. And that's probably a little bit easier to see. All right, now we have some particles falling and they keep falling for a long time, they don't need to fall quite as long. And I can adjust that if I go into the lifetime settings of my particles. So I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to change this. Yeah, let's just change it to 130. Start that from the beginning. Right, and that works. Awesome. So next I want to replace the particles that you see here with a mesh. 
And for snowflakes, I like to use the icosphere. Now, icospheres are made out of triangles instead of quads. And I like using icospheres at a lower resolution subdivision because they give me some interesting edges. You know, they're not perfectly round. So it just, it just makes more, it's just a in, more interesting snowflake, a more interesting shape, basically. Um, so here I'm just connecting. So here I just sent the render to object type in the particle system, and I connected the object, my icosphere, to the particle system. So now if I hit play, I need to change the scale. Let me go back to the render tab and change the scale of my object to one. And now you can start seeing that. And that looks a little bit more interesting. I can also uh, add scale randomness to it. All right, let's hit play. And that's starting to look a lot better. Now, I could technically be done with this, but that's a little bit boring. So let's add some forces to it. So the first force I'm going to add is a turbulence field. And turbulence will basically just add some random movement to your particles. Let's hit play. And I can go into my physics properties tab. And in here, I have a bunch of different options for the turbulence field. I can, for example, increase the strength. And I'm just going to Let's just go crazy. Let's try something like 40. And now you can see I'm getting some nice random movements in the particles. And that's starting to feel pretty good. The last thing I want to do is I think I want to give an overall direction to my particles. And for that, I'm going to use a wind force. So I'm going to add the wind. I'm just going to move that up and scale up the icon so you can see it a little bit better. And you can see the icon has a little arrow on one side, and that arrow basically indicates the direction of the wind. I'm going to increase the strength. And you can see the rings. The further apart the rings are, the stronger your wind force is. The closer together they are, the weaker your wind. Now I need to increase the particle's lifetime a bit. Hit play one more time. And let's just rotate that a little bit down. It doesn't need to be completely sideways. And there we go. Now there's a nice little bit of like, you know, there's some subtle winds in the air. There's a little bit of that turbulence. And, uh, you know, the part of the snowflakes are have an interesting shape, um, different sizes, and it just feels really nice. So that was my basic particle setup. Any questions that is great. on this? Yeah, so we have a few questions on particles and a few questions, comments catching up. Um, Kate Young says, I never thought of masking by normals facing up. That's brilliant. So Thank you. You, shared, <laughs> you shared good tidbits of wisdom today. Um, and then Amir wants to know, do you use HDRI for your final scene? Do I use an HDRI uh, to yeah. light my scene? Yes, yes. Okay, but yeah, we had, we, we had someone in the chat kind of answering for you, but I wanted to. Okay. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> no, I do. I do. I do. Okay. And then yeah. last last question from Amir is, do you use particles for scattering objects in your scene? No, I use the GeoNodes uh, and Blender. Uh, I like to use those for that. Um, yeah, that, I just think uh, I feel like I have more control with them. It gets a bit more technical, but uh, they're really fun. And you can also use weight paint to control them. And they're great for that. So I like to use them. Awesome. Prashan actually commented, as you said, that Blender's, Blender might be replacing the particle system with GeoNodes next year. So yes. I'm glad yes. that you're on, on top of that one. Yes. Awesome. They're awesome. Definitely try them out. Uh, yeah, actually, you can also, they're already in Blender 2.93. They're already in there. And then the, the experimental build has, them, has even more of it, I think. So definitely check it out. They're awesome. Cool. Um, actually, one thing I wanted to mention for the HDRI question, just to explain that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so uh, the one thing I didn't mention is that I like to use, uh, so the shader to RGB note that does the non-photorealistic, it actually only works with EV. So you have to kind of do all the rendering in EV. And that's why I definitely use my HDRIs to help me light my scene as well. So that's just something to I have thought is important to mention with that definitely. note. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thank, thank you for adding that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Are we ready? Because the next one is going to be super fun. Yeah, let's jump in. Because that's going to be dynamic paint. 
So dynamic paint can turn objects into canvases and brushes. So you can also create waves with it, and you can also use it to dynamically displace geometry, which I'm going to show you in just a little bit. So basically for my scene, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use the particles as my brush, and I'm going to use the frozen ground and the pond as my canvas. And as the particles get in touch or touch the frozen pond, I want them to switch my material from ice to snow. And as the snow particles get in touch with the ground, I want them to displace the ground as if, you know, snow is starting to build up on top of each other. So uh, let's take a look at how you can do that. This is like my favorite thing of this talk. I think it's so much fun. So, um, all right, here I have, again, the same scene we just set up. And uh, I'm going to select my uh, particle emitter. So this is, a, we have to do this in three steps. The first step is I'm going to take my particle emitter plane and I'm going to set it up as my brush. So here I select a dynamic paint. I change the type to brush and I'm going to click on add brush. Then I'm going to set the source to particle system and I'm going to connect or select the particle system in my scene. I don't need a wetness map, so I can turn that off. And I'm going to set the paint color to white. All right, that's the first step. Then the second step, is uh, I'm going to go into my shading tab and I'm going to set up my pond material. Now I'm just going to use a black and white material so you can easier see what I'm doing. But basically what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to use a mask and I'm going to use vertex colors uh, for my mask. So let me actually pause that for a second so I can talk about that a little bit more. So vertices can store paint for information. The more vertices your mesh has, the higher resolution the paint is going to be. Now we can add a hit play again. Now we can add a, a vertex color map to your mesh by going into the object data tab, which is this tab right here. Uh, and then you can go into the vertex color tab and you click on the plus button and then this will add a vertex color map to your mesh. Now to use that as a mask, I need an attribute node and then I can type in here under name. I just need to type in the name of the vertex color map and type that in there. And then the two of them are linked together. And this is basically how you can set up your material. So that's step number two. And step number three is I need to select the pond and I need to make that my canvas. So I need to add dynamic paint. Type is already set to canvas, so that's great. So let's just add canvas. And let's see, the surface type is set to paint, which is correct. I just need to add the brush collection, and that's the collection that has my particle emitter plane in it. Uh, the last important thing is, you can't forget that, is all the way in the bottom, I need to add the vertex color map that I just created into the paint map layer. If you don't do that, this won't work, so this is very important, and it's easy to figure because it's all the way on the bottom. Now, if I hit play, wherever the particles get in touch with the pond, they should change the material from black to white. So let's just wait for that. And there, you can start, it's, uh, it's starting to happen, which is pretty cool. Now I, I can just, uh, you can, I can use the particles radius. So the bigger the snowflakes are, the bigger the paint flat is going to be, the smaller, the smaller. Um, I can adjust radiuses. I can make, I can click dissolve. I can make changes to the material. Uh, so there's a lot of different options I can do now, but uh, yeah, this is the basic setup for dynamic paint, which is super awesome. I think people are just mind blown and very entertained cool? <laughs> with dynamic paint. Yeah, people are just like, oh, wow. Oh, I love yeah. this. This is so cool. And uh, wait until I show you the displays in just a minute. Which I think I'm about to do. Yeah, here we go. All right, so now I, uh, so I create the ground plane and click dynamic paint again. I Yes, it needs to be a canvas. And instead of the paint in my surface type, uh, back up. There we go. I just changed that to displace. And I also need to connect my particles. So the brush collection needs to be the snow. There we go. Again, that's where the particle emitter plane is in. And then if I hit play, uh, it should automatically displace the mesh. And you can see it's starting to happen right there. Now it's displacing the opposite way. So I just need to go into the displace factor and change that to a negative value. 
and now it's displacing the mesh upwards. Um, I can also uh, specify a maximum, like a maximum amount of displacement if I want to. And yeah, this is how you can dynamically displace your mesh, which is really awesome. And you can use this for like a number of things. For example, you could use it uh, if you have tires going through mud, for example, or um, uh, you can saw, you, you saw there's also a wave option in the surface type. So you could use that if you have a crocodile swimming through a lake. A lot of cool things you can do with this. And it's just fun to have something, you know, be dynamic. Yeah. We have think? a question. I think it's, I mean, it's mind blowing to me how, That's yeah, awesome, how, right? di how dynamic, <laughs> yeah, how dynamic it is. It's, it's crazy. Um, we do have a, we do have a question from Choppy Cortez that asks, um, are you using 3.0 fields of geonodes or 2.93? Uh, I'm currently still on 2.93. I'm a little behind. Um, but yes, uh, I did play with 3.0 briefly and I, it was uh, very exciting. And uh, I look forward to playing with it more once I have a little bit more time. But yeah. <laughs> and Amir likes the idea of having hot key cheat sheets on your screen. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, I'll actually talk about that in just a minute. Great segue. I was going to say, really nice, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, but basically this is sort of uh, my little uh, tips and tricks for uh, this scene and how I created some of it. There you can see the paw prints in the snow if you missed them earlier. Yeah, any last, any last minute questions about this or any uh, of that you saw? I think we're, I think we're ready to roll. People just seem to be really entertained and very soaking it all in. Well, that's good. Um, cause then, yeah. uh, uh, that's, I mean, that's great because then I'm going to go over to, uh, this. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I wanted to take a quick moment to announce my upcoming schoolism class, which happens to be an introduction to Blender class. So, um, so in that class, I will teach you all the basics, uh, you need to know to start creating your own 3d artwork. And, uh, if you're curious about Blender, uh, or 3d in general, then, uh, I hope you'll join my class. So. Yeah, that's why I wanted to. <laughs> that's why I was like, well, I'll talk about this later. Just wait, just wait. Yeah. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll be posting a link in the chat so that you can go and get to schoolism and be able to register for Sonia's upcoming Blender course. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we have a lot of people really motivated to get into Blender or to retry using Blender. So I, hopefully um, everybody who's watching join Sonia's class on schoolism. I'll be posting the link in the chat so that you can join in. Yeah, it's on it. It's it's an like it, it really is the best time to get into 3D. Like the tools have never been easier. Uh, I'm so jealous because uh, you don't you don't even want to know how hard it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good God! Uh, like I used to paint normal maps in Photoshop by hand, and oh God, no, you don't want to know. Um, so it's a great yeah. time too. It's Wait, a great time. Do you, <laughs> you want to end on any like your best your best like. Um original 3D making story, like some crazy project that you work on that was like mind blowingly hard that today would be relatively easy. We had, we um, had some, we had someone from Full Sail, uh, Tim Bowser say that he 3D modeled for a beer company. And because the internet didn't exist, they had to ship a 3D model. <laughs> Oh God. No, I mean, nothing, nothing to that extent. I don't think I had anything to that extent, thankfully, but uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's, it's just a bunch of different workflows that we didn't have back then that made things a lot more, uh, it was a lot more manual work uh, or a lot of, uh, you know, you had to do a lot of cheats that nowadays, like I don't even, I wouldn't even have to think twice about. So I don't think there's a specific example. I don't think uh, I can give. Um, yeah. Except for like having to paint the normal map from scratch at one point, And that was really not fun. Um, Good God, that was a nightmare. Um, but no, other than that, I don't think there was anything that really stands out quite to that extent. Um, but I do actually have something else I'd like to announce. Um, so uh, that is, uh, if you'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, my career path, um, like how I got to where I am today, uh, I'm actually doing an interview with Bobby tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and there's also going to be a live Q&A afterwards. So if there's some questions, you, you know, I didn't get to answer today, then you can ask me tomorrow as well. And then I'm also doing two panels tomorrow, busy weekend. Um, one is about life action and the other one is about video games. So hopefully you can join me for those as well. And uh, yeah. you're, you're, you're gonna have these on your socials? Yes, they're on my Instagram awesome. as well. Mm -hmm. So everybody, please visit the description box below. We have a link to all of Sonia's socials. So you can check out the sessions coming up. 
as well as the link to schoolism, which I've posted in the chat. Please register for her class. It's going to be amazing, I'm sure. Um, and then don't miss the exclusive Lightbox giveaways that we've hidden in our description boxes of our live streams, as well as in the scavenger hunt in the artist alley for you. Cool. I, yeah. I, I, I think we're wrapping up. That was a great session. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you for everybody to tuning in and enjoy the rest of Lightbox Expo. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you. Bye. Bye.